welcome to everyone to the webinar Accelerating Impact in Asia Pacific, promoted by the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment and UNSCAP. My name is Raffaella. I work at the GSG as National Advisory Board Community Manager. And it's really a pleasure to see here uh, all these participants. So I think since we are so many, let's let's start with uh, with a nice breaker. Uh, you will see now on your screen a very simple question, just where are you from? Uh, select your option. And if you want to add uh, some details, feel free to write in the chat box the name of your country or the name of the city. We are going to comment it live. So please select, select your option. From India, hi. Thailand, hi, Japan. Hello, welcome. Malaysia, hi. In May. So we should probably have the results of the poll. Singapore, of course, India. Well, okay, of course, I see. So a uh, majority of people came come from Asia Pacific region, but we have also some outsider. Hi, Austin from, Z from Zambia, hi. So you won't be disappointed because actually during the rest, during the, the this one hour and a half, uh, our amazing speakers are going to run us through a series of best experiences and concrete actions that governments are undertaking in their countries. And you will see that many of these, of these experiences are actually applicable also to other places, not only to, to Asia Pacific. And you will see that we share many more priorities and challenges probably than you think. So let me just present briefly uh, the agenda for today. We, uh, next speakers are Sebastian Velichenko from the GSG and Jonathan Wong from USCAP, who will share with us some highlights from the report towards an enabling policy environment for impact investing in Asia Pacific. Then Tristan Ace from the British Council will present, uh, will, will tell us how social enterprises are addressing COVID-19 emergency, sharing some highlights. I want to thank our keynote speaker, Jorge Moreira da Silva from the OECD Development Cooperation Directorate, who will tell us how to best work internationally in order to promote a sustainability message. And and then we will go into our uh, panel moderated by Rosemary Addis from GSG Ambassador and Impact Investing in Australia with Aras Tokan, the chair of the Bangladesh National Advisory Board, one of our now more active and engaged with the public sector, Patsyan Lo from Asian Venture Philanthropy Association, who better than her to give an overview of what is happening in the region, and I want to thank again Jamila Mahmoud from the government of Malaysia because she's going to give us uh, the policymaker perspective. And please stay with us until the end because Christina Dora and Jonathan Wong will launch our call to action. This report, this project is not an ending point. Uh, this is, we are not here to present just the results of a project. This is really a starting point because we want to engage with you, we want to work with you in order to create social and environmental change. So let me welcome here Sebastian and Jonathan. You can turn on your camera. And just one quick message. Uh, we want to keep this webinar very interactive. It's, it's important for us. We want to hear from you. We want to discuss with you. So use the Q&A function, use the chat box in order to share your comments. Really, please do it. We will go through all over uh, your, your comments and you will see that there are also some slots in order to, to comment it and to, and to respond to you. So thank you, Seb and Jonathan, floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Rafaela. Uh, a good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. 
Um, I'm Jonathan Wong. I'm the Chief of Technology Innovation at the UN uh, Commission for Asia and the Pacific. And in my role, I advise governments on technology, innovation, entrepreneurship, impact investing policy, that sort of stuff. Um, I just want to very quickly um, re really say a few words about how this report came about uh, and, and give some context on impact investing policy making, particularly in Asia Pacific. Now, now on how this report came about, I think it was about four years ago now, I, I, I met with a minister of finance who, 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 from Asia who shall remain nameless. And she said to me, actually by saying she, I probably narrowed it down a bit more now. Um, she said to, I was trying to convince her how important impact investing was for the SDGs, all, all that sort of lovely stuff. And she said, okay, Jonathan, you've sold me. It, I get it, impact investing is really important. What should I do as a government policymaker? And, and I'm not usually lost for words, but I actually didn't know what to say. And I, and I felt quite embarrassed at the time. And I, so I thought, okay, okay, I need to do something about that. And maybe do some more thinking about actually what government should do to harness impact investing for the SDGs. And I think about, I think about three years ago now, two or three years ago, um, I met Christina in a very nice restaurant in Singapore, actually, um, during the ABPN. In, I suppose in, in, in those glory days of in-person meetings and usually uh, at the ABP event where, where most of my collaborations happen. And we said, actually, why don't we collaborate on, on, on actually looking at that question around what should policymakers do to harness impact investing for the SDGs? And, and could we develop some sort of playbook around that? And, and, and this is where, where, where this, this partnership happened. Um, in terms of context, of course, I, I have to mention the SDGs, otherwise I'll be fired. But um, the, the funding gap for the SDGs is very, very evident. And the need for impact investing to, to help fulfill that gap is very clear. But, but beyond that, and I think if, if COVID-19 has taught us anything, is that we need actually a new model or indeed an evolved model for an economy that actually works better for society and environment as well. And, and very fortunately, what we've seen in the Asia Pacific region is governments really leading that charge. Um, for what it's worth, I think a couple of years ago now, the, the impact investing um, appeared in a UN resolution for the very first time, where the 62 member states and associate member states of the UN for Asia Pacific uh, committed to uh, to creating enabling environments for social enterprise impact investing. So again, first time in the UN's history actually appeared and, and getting that real consensus and government commitment for this agenda in the region. And through this research as well, we've seen this explosion of impact investing policies across the whole region, um, both in Asia and the Pacific, not just on the supply side, but on the demand side as well, around policies around things like social enterprise uh, and inclusive business as well. Uh, and really kind of the, the, the rather kind of, if you like, bold objective of, of, this, of this report when we, when we started on this journey was I was really thinking, how could we turn impact investing policy making for governments more from art to science in many ways and, and try to create a framework around that? Uh, and so I'll, I'll hand over to Seb very shortly to talk more about the framework and, and the approach we're taking around this. But before I do, I, I just really want to thank all the people who have collaborated on this report. And we've been working on this report for a good few years now and collaborated with many, many people, and actually too many people to mention here. If you look in the acknowledgements page of this report, it's almost as long as the report itself. Um, but, but a huge thank you to everyone who's collaborated on this. It's been really helpful to give us that challenge, that feedback and uh, the energy and the insights to actually make this report as, as good as we can. Um, I'm, I'm very mindful of the time, so I, I, I will stop there. And again, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session and I'll, I'll very quickly hand over to Seb. Over to you, Seb. Hi, hi Jonathan, hi everyone, thank you so much. It will be a good morning um, for me from uh, Buenos Aires. So I would thank uh, UNESCAP and I would thank all the wonderful partners who contributed uh, insights, uh, as Jonathan was saying, the acknowledgements uh, page is insane, but it also talks about uh, the richness uh, and the depth of the, of the partnerships we built uh, to try to contribute the best uh, possible uh, insights. And I will uh, thank uh, the pandemic. I think one of the good uh, spillovers is that we are able to get together uh, across so many countries, across uh, so many time zones to, to be together. So thank you everyone for, for joining. Um, as Jonathan was saying, we started uh, this effort way beyond, uh, you know, we even could imagine uh, that we would be going through this crisis. Um, and then the crisis hit in the middle of the effort and it made us realize that this kind of discussions was in this context more, more needed uh, than, than before, that that funding gap for the SDGs, uh, if anything, uh, was getting bigger and that the effects of the crisis was uh, getting all of us further away from achieving uh, the SDGs and exacerbating uh, many of the pre-existing problems 
that led us to think about how to uh, engage pro greater pools of private capital into the social and the environmental agenda. Um, so if you think about health uh, and education and the development of the labor market, uh, all of them today are facing greater challenges than what they did, let's say, before the end of uh, last year. Um, and we are seeing that very tragically the most vulnerable in our societies are feeling it uh, the hardest. They have been the hardest hit. The informal workers have been uh, left without uh, an income and that now will struggle. And we need active policies to get them back into the labor market, both in terms of finding new jobs and also reskilling to be able to fulfill uh, new roles. Uh, we are seeing so many millions of uh, young children that were out of school at the peak of the pandemic, uh, and many of them won't uh, come back um, to school automatically. They were struggling to remain in school to begin with, and, and, and the challenges of the crisis will make uh, those uh, efforts even, even harder. Um, impact investment, uh, we think, is at the core uh, of this need to bring in writer uh, capital to, to the space uh, of, of the social dimension and the environmental dimension. And as Jonathan was saying, uh, in, in helping reshape the very nature of capitalism, um, putting in, in, in plainer terms, changing the DNA of capitalism to incorporate um, a third dimension, which is a dimension of, of impact, uh, the measure of our impact uh, of, of our actions in society and the planet to the traditional notions of risk and return that historically have determined uh, if an investor, a company, a corporate would go for project A or project B or project C. Uh, we see a new world integrating also in that optimization, the notion of impact uh, as, as, as a core element of everything we do. The government has a crucial role to play in enabling, fostering and stimulating this revolution in the world of investment. But the revolution that we see in the world of impact goes beyond investment. If we think about the whole economy, uh, consumption also has a role to play and is evolving towards impact. And governments certainly are accompanying this revolution in terms of enabling uh, the dynamics in the world of investment, but also doing things in their own right to embrace impact and put it at the center of their agenda of delivery. So in this resource, in this uh, research effort we discuss a set of very practical tools for government wanted to advance this movement uh, in their markets. And we do so by leveraging a framework uh, we developed years back, uh, or it was you know, mainly developed by the um, OECD, and you will hear from them uh, more later on. Uh, and we typified different roles for government to stimulate the growth of this movement. Uh, and also across demand of capital, supply of capital, intermediation. So you will read about what the government can do to facilitate, to build a market. For example, by having dedicated central units uh, in, in the national government or in subnational governments, or by developing consistent national strategies like we've seen very successfully across many countries. But you also will learn about uh, the role of government as a participant. Um, so today we are discussing very um, contemporaneous frameworks to include the impact in all the government procurement systems or uh, transitioning to outcomes-based commissioning as a superior alternative to the traditional input-based commissioning in public procurement or establishing impact wholesalers of capital uh, that also not only play a role in the supply of capital side, but also as a market builder. Um, and that on top of many other regulatory aspects that governments need to take on very seriously, uh, like you know, providing specific legal forms for impact uh, companies or setting standards for the industry. So the, the, I, I think the main message and reinforcing what Rafa said in the beginning is, is two things. One is that this is an ever evolving field uh, and we did never aim to write a report, uh, just to write a report but we wanted to create a true toolkit to inspire uh, action. But we are conscious that adoption of these very exciting policies and others will need a massive local adaptation because they need to be context specific and they need to be fine tuned vis-a-vis -vis the social and environmental issues they are there to resolve. And they will be as effective as their real capacity to, to drive uh, change. 
So as Rafa was saying, we see this as, as the very beginning uh, of a journey from the Global Steering Group uh, perspective that I represent as Chief Policy Officer and together with all uh, the colleagues we have here, and I, and, I, and I know I'm saying this also on behalf of the ESCAP, we are here to work together with all of you, with stakeholders in each of the countries, with our friends from the ABPM, from the British Council, and everyone you will hear from, but especially each of you in the countries that will understand better how to adapt uh, these tools and make it most relevant to your environment. So thank you all for joining and looking forward to hearing from colleagues for you today and having your comments and, and, and inspiration to drive change forward once you had a chance to review uh, this report. Thank you. Okay, so thank you um, both Jonathan and uh, Sebastian there for your um, introduction. Um, I'm also delighted to join this um, webinar. My name is uh, Tristan Ace and I lead the British Council's work uh, in social entrepreneurship across uh, the Asia Pacific region. And we've been working with all of the partners um, that are um, involved in this webinar for a number of years now to support, work with, learn from, governments in um, the Asia Pacific region as they build the infrastructure to support the impact economy. So we've been working with uh, UNSCAP, with GSG and ADPN now in building and working with and collaborating with governments as they, as they build the right policy infrastructure to support um, the growth of the impact investment, uh, impact investment and social enterprise across the region. And um, just to reiterate a few things that Jonathan and Seth have said, we have seen a really rapid increase in interest and activity, and in many cases, actual policy initiatives or policy measures that have been um, implemented by governments in this region. And that's really been very encouraging now to see this from what was back when we began this work in um, around three or four years ago, something that was quite marginal to um, government priorities, now become really central to thinking around economic development, around national planning, and around how to reimagine and rethink the way that um, public services are delivered as well. Um, I wanted just to spend a couple of minutes to talk through some work that we've been doing, again, in partnership with the United Nations, ESCAP, to explore the impact of COVID-19 on uh, social enterprises across, across the world, but of course, I'll focus particularly on, on this region, East and South Asia. Um, we will be launching the report, the final report, next week on Wednesday, the 9th of December. So please do look out for that webinar. Um, we'll be highlighting um, the, the key findings from that report um, in, uh, in, in next week. So please do join us for that. But I just wanted to sort of touch on some of the findings uh, today in this, um, this particular session and particularly focus on the ones that, that, that related to government and, and, of course, focus on the ones in this region. So we, we found that over a third of social enterprises um, in, uh, well, globally, but particularly in South and East Asia, reported that it was very difficult for them to access government support during the pandemic, which, and that was felt more acutely in South Asia. Southeast Asia actually did a bit better, um, according to the data we have, um, in responding to, to in, in government support for social enterprises. So it shows us that there's still more to be done. And I think that it's interesting because when you look at the actual positive news stories around social enterprises and their response, we see that actually only 1% of social enterprises reported that they had to shut down. So we find them that they, they are resilient and we also find that they are innovating. Um, and it's interesting to note that the social enterprises that have managed to adapt and evolve um, uh, and um, pivot their business models have um, been the ones that are that are more, most optimistic about future growth coming out of the pandemic. Um, we also found that, um, that in many cases social enterprises have been at the forefront of um, responding to the impact of COVID in communities right across the region here in Southeast and, and Southeast Asia. So it does make sense we think that, that this that this these types of businesses can potentially lead the way out of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, a crisis and that we need to really now intensify efforts to support and work with governments to see how we can do that more acutely. Um, I think one thing I would say though, um, and this is again just emerging findings, 
rather the enterprises that have been hit the hardest, um, the social enterprises that have been hit the hardest have been ones that have been led by women and ones that have been uh, there to support some of the most vulnerable communities across the region. So that perhaps is a little bit more worrying. And again, help, will, it, will perhaps force us and, 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 and to think through how we can um, really provide the support infrastructure to those enterprises that are engaging, supporting, providing products and services to some of the most vulnerable communities in this region. So um, again, I'll stop there. I won't reveal too much at this stage, but please do join us for the formal launch of our report uh, next uh, next week, next Wednesday, the 9th of December, and um, on social media for, for how you might do that. Um, it's now um, my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for today's webinar. And I'm delighted to have somebody with us who has both experience of multinational organizations and at the heart of government to talk through how government um, can support, give us some inspiration about how government can support and, and encourage and accelerate the, um, the, the role um, of impact investment globally. So I'm delighted to, to, to introduce Jorge Moreira da Silva. I hope my pronunciation was better than it was in our practice session earlier today. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Da Silva is the director of the Development Corporation Directorate at the OECD. But perhaps more interestingly for our session today, he was between 2013 and 2015, uh, Portugal's Minister of Environment, Energy and Spatial Planning. So has direct experience of government and how you can influence government to, uh, to change policy and, and, and try to innovate in the way that we think about uh, doing development um, and, uh, differently. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jorge for his keynote address. Thank you, Tristan. I'd like to thank um, UNSCAP and, and GHG for this um, invitation. We are really glad to join forces with you in the launch of of the report uh, towards an enabling policy environment for impact investment in Asia and the Pacific. This could not come at a more important uh, time. And let me start by highlighting some of the findings that we provided uh, two weeks ago uh, in our uh, Global Outlook on Financing for Sustainable Development, because this shows how uh, relevant it is to discuss uh, um, investment uh, solutions beyond uh, official development uh, assistance. Uh, overall, the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis uh, risks creating a major uh, uh, setbacks in financing for sustainable development, uh, what we could call almost a collapse of development finance. Let's make no mistake, we were missing $2.5 trillion uh, before the crisis uh, to implement SDGs. Now, uh, what we know, it's regarding developing countries uh, uh, setbacks is that uh, they have been uh, uh, facing not just uh, a drop uh, of external finance uh, around $700 billion this year, mainly due to the drop on foreign direct investment and remittances, but also uh, an additional uh, need uh, of $1 trillion uh, uh, in response to COVID, both in the emergency uh, status, but also in the, in the build back better uh, uh, well, project. So uh, we are dealing with, a, with an additional gap of $1.7 uh, trillion dollars, uh, or about uh, 70%. Therefore, uh, I think that we would all agree that we need urgent action uh, to shift the balance in favor of sustainable and inclusive development. And this is the moment where uh, supporting develop, uh, developing countries uh, uh, is really uh, crucial. And there is no margin of maneuver for any sort of hesitation. In this context, uh, Asian countries are positioned to be an important source uh, of global economic uh, uh, recovery. We know that uh, uh, our uh, partners in the region have demonstrated strong roles in the in past years. Uh, this has been fundamental, not just for the region, but also uh, for the global growth. Um, however, we also know that uh, um, uh, due to the, to the COVID crisis, some countries are facing the prospect of dire uh, economic uh, conditions which, which could severely impact their long-term development uh, uh, prospects as a result of reduced uh, investment, uh, interrupted uh, uh, global value chains, major disruptions in trade uh, and tourism, and conditions that uh, threaten financial collapse for many uh, small and micro enterprises. Uh, I don't need to go into uh, much details on, on what is happening in tourism with a, with a decline that could be up to 70% or the impact in small uh, 
uh, island developing states uh, where tourism uh, generates between 30 and 40% of, of, of GDP, uh, in addition to their vulnerability to other, to other shocks. We also know uh, that in, the, in this context of the COVID, uh, micro, small and, and, and medium-sized enterprises, while playing a critical role in emerging economies, they are at the same time uh, under huge stress uh, um, due to this, uh, to this crisis. So there is a potential, but at the same time, we are dealing with, uh, with major risks. Uh, so let, let's, let's focus on, on what is needed uh, uh, to provide uh, a compelling response, uh, and therefore, what's the role of impact investment in this context. Uh, in response to the, sh in the short term uh, ODA, but also other sources of development finance should be protected, uh, increase it where possible, and leverage to uh, mitigate the drop in other sources of, of financing. Um, uh, governments must lead by uh, example, uh, same way that they are leading by example at home, uh, uh, providing uh, public uh, financial packages to leverage uh, private uh, investment. The same should happen at the global level where ODA and development finance uh, must play a vital uh, role. Uh, ODA, uh, it's uh, uh, in, in recent years around uh, $153 billion. And it has proven to be the most uh, resilient source of external finance, uh, alleviating the impact uh, of past wow. crises. If you go back to the last 60 years, you would conclude that ODA has been resilient and in some cases even counter-cyclical, uh, dealing uh, with the crisis, uh, uh, leading by example and providing the support uh, that uh, is missing in the, in, the, in the market. So I'm still confident that ODA, again, official development assistance will play a role. We have heard from uh, the OECD DAC members, the members of the Development Assistance Committee, their pledges to support uh, LDCs and other countries uh, uh, with specific needs uh, by uh, uh, responding to their immediate uh, uh, needs as the pandemic uh, evolves. Early estimates uh, suggest that $12 uh, billion uh, were mobilized by DAC members uh, for COVID-19. In Asia, the Asian Development Bank has reacted promptly, uh, providing support to its uh, uh, developing uh, member states. Uh, altogether, while uh, ODA, Official Development Assistance, and international aid policies can assist in short term, a robust private sector is a fundamental uh, mo motor of uh, long-term uh, sustainable and inclusive economic growth. That's why we are here today it's to discuss how we can better mobilize uh, resources, uh, including from impact investment, um, uh, that uh, uh, could benefit not just from uh, uh, the, the, the ODA and the public sector, but also from entrepreneurship from the, the, the private sector. Principles for blending public and private uh, development finance are uh, crucial, uh, and the OECD agree with two years ago on a, on a set of principles on blended finance for sustainable uh, development. Uh, our work uh, with Indonesia has, has shown that this is vital, the, uh, the implementation of this sort of, of principles. Uh, and uh, I'd like again to emphasize the role of Indonesia in the three Takarana uh, roadmap uh, on blended finance. To support this, we have recently presented uh, in, a, in a joint work with UNDP uh, a public uh, a policy action framework for using public finance and regulations to mobilize and align more global assets in support uh, of the SDGs and climate uh, goals. Uh, governments in developed countries are de deploying recovery and rebuilding uh, uh, packages, and this is likely to be a multi-year uh, experience uh, given the continuity uh, of the COVID challenges and its economic and social consequences. This is, this is an opportunity. So if, if, if countries are mobilizing these recovery packages, this is the moment where we need, when focusing on this build forward backer, to include social and environmental impact considerations in these big COVID-19 recovery packages that have been deployed, both at the national, but also regional and global level. The OECD and GH, GHG uh, partnership has a strong role to play to promote uh, impact investment 
as part of these recovery strategies. We first joined forces in 2018 for the OECD policy framework for uh, social impact investment in 2019, the OECD uh, report on social impact investment, impact imperative, and we also partner uh, in many uh, side events at the, uh, of the G20 development working group in Argentina and in Japan and advanced social impact investment in this important multilateral forum. So you can see that this partnership uh, has been uh, crucial, I think, to advance this uh, agenda uh, worldwide. Uh, this work shows uh, uh, that governments can uh, play many roles in supporting impact investment. This is highlighted in the report that uh, we are discussing today. Uh, governments can play uh, a role uh, uh, acting as market facilitators, uh, enabling uh, the development of uh, impact markets, as market participants, uh, providing financial uh, and non-financial support, and last but not least, as market regulators, implementing laws and policies that enable and support impact uh, ecosystems. And I can speak by experience being, uh, in the past, uh, Secretary of State, Member of Parliament, Minister, I know uh, that there is no investment if governments uh, don't do their uh, work as regulators, creating the, the investment condition through structural reforms to attract this uh, investment. So this role of governments as market facilitators, market participants and market regulators, it's vital when dealing with uh, impact investment. We have come to recognize that COVID-19 crisis calls for the responses to build back better, to be anchored uh, in local contexts needs and realities. And again, this is a point that is made in a very compelling way in the report that we are discussing today. That this is why an analysis of uh, the policies and government actions uh, at national level is the right approach uh, to showcase uh, uh, commonalities and differences across uh, Asian countries. And I hope uh, that in the future, uh, we will be able to join forces again to unpack the realities uh, of other regions, including uh, African uh, countries. Uh, the report uh, discussed today uh, outlines actions that governments can take to support uh, embedding impact considerations into recovery plans and policy making uh, to foster uh, the development of more uh, inclusive uh, economies. Uh, what I particularly appreciate in the report is the recognition of the interconnectedness of social and environmental challenges which need to be tackled and solved jointly. To conclude, let, let me focus now uh, in the future and what is needed uh, to uh, continue support uh, driving finance towards uh, sustainable development and fostering more impact investment. Let me just give you three uh, uh, action areas which I think uh, are essential to push this agenda forward. First, uh, solid uh, impact uh, measurement and management systems that allow us to assess and monitor the results and ultimately uh, the results of impact investments and support actions. Uh, these tools um, need to be harmonized uh, and made available to all uh, stakeholders, including donors. This is why at OECD, we are working on uh, developing impact standards for uh, financing sustainable uh, development. Uh, this is a set of standards for donors uh, uh, in order for these standards to be aligned with industry best practice, um, they are being developed in partnership with the uh, UNDP uh, SDG impact standards uh, team. The GSG, uh, with uh, its collaboration and engagement in the Harvard Business uh, School on impact weighted accounting standards, is working in the same direction, uh, filling the gap of current income uh, statements uh, and balance sheets, uh, which uh, do not account for environmental and social uh, externalities uh, of uh, corporations. And I had the pleasure to invite Sir Ronald Cohen recently to uh, give a keynote speech at the, at the OECD, where he presented uh, this uh, work uh, from GSG with the Harvard Business School. The second crucial point, it's about transparency. Uh, the OECD has worked uh, on this topic as part of the three ITA Karana roadmap on blended finance, championed by uh, our OECD key partner, Indonesia, and recognized uh, by the G20 as an important uh, multi-stakeholder platform. Uh, we are planning to do further work on this uh, area of transparency 
uh, in the next uh, uh, two years. But last but not the least, if we are going to beat this crisis uh, and recover from its consequences, uh, international cooperation is more important than ever. Uh, the public sector can play a role in mobilizing the whole, the whole system, uh, the whole ecosystem uh, towards more sustainable investments, uh, including investors, uh, asset managers, enterprises, social economic uh, organizations, experts and civil society organizations. So this, this creation of the ecosystem, more than the creation, the mobilization of the, of the entire ecosystem uh, towards uh, more sustainable investment, it's uh, uh, critical. Um, we are doing, uh, we are giving our contribution as well. Uh, the OECD is working uh, through the, the, the DAC community of practice on private uh, finance for sustainable development, which was launched uh, uh, in January 2020. And today, over 340 members, we are glad to count uh, all the support and participation of, of GSG uh, in this community. And we look forward to continue to work together to improve the knowledge and practice of impact uh, investment. Uh, I also uh, uh, would like to highlight that there are several experiences that could be shared. I'm coming from a country that has a good experience. The Portugal Social Innovation Fund uh, was a powerful case study for a country-based strategy for aligning stakeholders and creating ecosystem for uh, impact investment. There are many, many other examples. So I think that one of the benefits of today's discussion is precisely sharing uh, uh, information, knowledge, and, and creating the conditions to move this agenda uh, in a critical moment. And again, Tristan, thank you very much for your uh, invitation and, and for you to, uh, to, to, to be in this event. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Olga, for your um, inspiring words and all of the, the fantastic context you provided there with the, with, with the priorities around impact investment. Um, so I'm delighted now to uh, hand over to our, our question and answer session, an opportunity to um, engage with, uh, with everyone who's on the call here um, this afternoon. Um, and for that, I'm going to hand over to Rosemary Addis, um, who will uh, lead us through and moderate um, that discussion. So Rosemary, um, if you are here, um, over, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Tristan, and, um, and thanks to everybody for setting the context for, for this discussion. I think first up, um, Jorge, we have a, a couple of questions that, that people have asked in relation to the points that, that you made, bringing together the work that's being done at the, at the OECD. Um, and some people were curious to understand, in, in addition to mobilizing more capital and, um, and the challenges ahead of us, what are some of the things we, we need to think about differently um, in order to meet the challenges of building back better? Well, I, I think it's 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 important to go beyond uh, the speed dial, and uh, if we just focus on the amounts that we are mobilizing, uh, we we will miss the, the the results that we want to achieve. Let me give you one example, but I think it's always good to give examples on blended finance, and we have been working on blended finance for many years. We have seen a, an excellent uh, trajectory in terms of mobilization. Um, more than $200 billion mobilized from private sector through official initiatives that leverage this private investment, crowding in public and private money. But, but let me tell you what's happened in practical terms. We concluded that, unfortunately, only 5% of this blended finance is going to least developed countries, and only 5% of the overall amount is going to the social sector, health, and education. In practical terms, what does it mean? It means that we have uh, seen a segregation of the financing where ODA is uh, being uh, uh, targeting uh, LDCs and this innovative finance such as blended finance is going mainly to middle income countries and to the infrastructure sector such as energy, uh, uh, transportation, uh, logistics, etc. So on impact investment, we cannot get the same outcome. I think it's important that while we integrate the social and environmental uh, dimensions in this uh, um, investment, that uh, we, we make sure through regulation uh, and de-risking that uh, we focus on those most in need and uh, maximizing the impact. And unfortunately, we are dealing with some fragmentation 
we are what you cannot measure, you cannot manage, you cannot incentivize, and we are missing a yardstick. Uh, it's amazing to see the proliferation of initiatives on impact investment, but we still miss uh, uh, the capacity to measure uh, the impact in comparable manners, to have a, a database that can help us learning uh, from experience. So I would say that the OECD being a standard setter is working hard to define a, a good regulation in this area, not to create bureaucracy or red tape, but by contrary, to uh, maximize the, impo the impact of these initiatives. And I think that the GSG uh, is doing the, the same, and it's great that we are joining forces in, in many uh, impact standards uh, definitions. And there's obviously been a lot of movement in that area in the last in the last couple of years, I know that we worked with some of your colleagues and others in um, in looking at what would be needed to grow the market a couple of years ago. And at that stage, the call for principles and standards, and there weren't any in the market. And in two short years, we've done a lot of work, but there's obviously still a lot more that needs to happen in, in convergence and building that out. Which perhaps brings me to another one of the questions that's been asked as, as well. While we're still doing that work, we don't want governments to wait to be active in this in this area, whether as donors or in their own country settings. Do you have a top selling point for for governments to get started and get involved? Well, again, giving one example of one area, the area of climate, uh, we, we, we know that we want to fix uh, the problem, uh, the overall problem, if we have a response to COVID that is not compatible with the response to the climate crisis. So rather than having any sort of hesitation, this is the moment where impact investment, blended finance, uh, and all sorts of finance uh, should uh, build back greener and uh, using the good information that we have about uh, the, the, the capacity to, uh, while mainstreaming climate considerations in microeconomic policies, to uh, uh, maximize the impact, uh, uh, the outcome, the economic outcome of uh, the OECD again, we produced a report that shows that investing in climate is investing in growth. We can have a, a, an additional 5% GDP uh, when integrating these uh, dimensions. We have also seen uh, uh, well, relevant uh, outcomes from the integration of ESG uh, in, in, uh, in uh, assets under management. But again, uh, we are missing uh, uh, some uh, capacity to measure the impact of some of these investments. So I would say that uh, this is a moment where impact investment can uh, really provide a compelling answer, not just for this crisis, but also for the climate crisis. And if you don't mind, of course, my focus is on developing countries. I, I think that the big concern that we all face is seeing a market uh, being deployed. The impact investment market is being deployed in a quite uh, entrepreneurial, innovative uh, way, but we need this to source uh, and and, and to be applied to developing countries uh, context. Why? Because 80% of the investments needed on climate uh, are uh, from developing countries. So if we have blended finance, impact investment, all this innovative finance beyond public finance targeting uh, the rich countries, we won't be ready to support developing countries in this critical journey where the pandemics, but also climate put their uh, countries uh, under huge stress on social and economic dimensions. And this is obviously an area where we could see um, donors and, and others um, reaching beyond, as you've said, the, um, the middle income countries to the harder to reach areas and, um, and where the need is, is greatest so that um, we can ensure that there's more justice in how we're tackling climate and how we're building back as well. Um, we've come to the end of our time. Jorge, thank you very much for joining us today. It's terrific to have you here. I know that um, you were um, with us in, in Portugal, if I remember correctly, back in uh, in 2016, when we were just uh, translating from the task force to the GSG. Um, and it's, uh, it's terrific that we have these opportunities to continue to work with you and now with your team at, at the DAC at, at OECD and other colleagues. Um, thanks very much for sharing your views with us today. Thank you, Rosemary. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I'm now going to introduce the 
panel that we have with us, we have Dr. Jamila uh, Mahud, we have Arastu Khan from the Bangladesh NAB, um, and Patsy Anlo from AVPN. If you would each turn your cameras uh, and on and um, we will uh, kick off the panel session where we're going to take the, the theme of, of the practical focus of this report, which Sebastian and, and Jonathan and others have mentioned, um, and <laughs> look at that in the context of some of these countries. Um, I will just ask our speakers, if you don't mind muting your microphones while uh, just in the interim, and uh, when I ask you to speak, if you can take yourselves off mute, that would be terrific, thank you. Um, so at the GST, we've had the extraordinary opportunity to look at the context across different countries. Now 33 countries uh, and 28 national advisory boards across different regions. And policy has always been a big part of the work that we've been doing with governments being a really important partner. And we've always thought we can't wait for governments to act, but without them, the impact that we can have is slower and um, and it will take much longer to achieve and to mobilise others. We've heard about the report uh, building on other work that's been done by the GSG, looking at what is the roles that governments can play and what is the toolbox that they have to work with. And when we're answering that question that Jonathan put of where do, where do you start, I think that they're two great questions. First of all, what role are we trying to play here? and also what tools do we have? There's another question as well, which speaks to some of the questions that have been coming through from, from people on this webinar today, which is what is it that we're trying to achieve and how can we use these tools, not for their own sake, but to achieve things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Sometimes that's about more funding and finance in the right places. Sometimes that's about the, uh, the capacity to achieve better outcomes when we're looking for less binary solutions about whether something is public or private or enabling social innovation and reach that can come from leveraging the different skills and financial elements. We certainly know that if we can't get resources to the right places, then it's really hard for enterprises, for solutions to be able to grow. And that's an incredibly important um, aspect if we're going to be able to scale it's also a, an important aspect of what government can look at because governments are charged with looking at the macro view, whether that's in their own countries or from a regional perspective. You're gonna hear from each of our speakers on this panel about the experiences in, in their countries and, and regions. Uh, Jamila has a role with the Prime Minister in Malaysia and also a perspective looking at partnerships from her role with the with the Red Cross and, and deep experience in public health. Uh, Arastu has worked in, in banking, including at the, at the World Bank and has an active role in the Bangladeshi NAB and in a, a country where there is um, significant challenge, but also a lot of opportunity and entrepreneurial drive. Um, Patsy Ann can bring us a, a perspective from across the region through her work with the Asia Venture Philanthropy Network, and they have done a lot of work engaging different actors and looking at the policy dimensions across uh, the Asian region. So welcome everybody um, today. And where I want to focus our conversation is around how you see that policy makers can work with other sectors and, um, and look at funding and finance to be able to increase the capital that's flowing to the right places for the solutions we need to, to build back better and to ensure a, a, a just and impact-led recovery um, that can uh, be delivering better outcomes for, for people, particularly in the face of, of the challenges that we know have been brought by by COVID. Uh, we might start, Jamila, with, with your experience um, and we'd love to hear your perspectives on that, the role of, of policy and how that's played out in the Malaysian context. Thank you very much, uh, Rosemary. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, maybe let me start by saying that Malaysia's uh, impact <coughs> uh, driven investment landscape has been really quite uh, 
um, impressive in Southeast Asian region, but certainly with a lot of room for improvement. And coming back to your question on what policies have driven it, certainly uh, the government has put in place some policies that are uh, going to help us think through um, impact investment. For example, uh, looking at you know guidelines on sustainable and responsible investment, uh, the frameworks that were developed in terms of particularly in this in this country uh, around uh, Islamic bonds or sukuk, and the SRI framework on uh, sukuk has been really quite important. Uh, and also looking at the ESG as a as a requirement uh, uh, in in Malaysia, um, the SRI roadmap uh, in 2019 really is uh, um, envisioning Malaysia's uh, uh, developing ecosystem for green and impact investment. So I think uh, having those uh, in place are, are important. Uh, I, and I think that one of the things that Malaysia has done probably is uh, putting some of these policies into practice and trying to show uh, how it might work. And I think there's a great value in experimentation and particularly the innovation space, which is, which is what social impact investing is. Um, there has to be room for that experimentation. So maybe if I can highlight a couple of things. Um, the uh, Islamic bond, the Sukuk Isan, uh, was a good example where the the focus was really on education, and it was uh, uh, um, uh, issuance that was both uh, government but also retail. Uh, and uh, what it did was uh, the proceeds were put into a uh, or channeled through uh, trust schools, uh, and um, the, the, with a tenure of seven years uh, and with uh, annual payments. And it was structured uh, particularly around uh, Sharia principles for, for Malaysian uh, investors. And it's noteworthy that the yield to a maturity depends on whether the key performance indicators for the sukuk are met. So missing the KPIs meant that investors would get a higher yield of 4.6% uh, at full redemption. And if the KPIs are fulfilled, uh, they would see um, a lower yield via mandatory reduction of 3.18%, uh, uh, and the sukuk would be redeemed at 96.28%. So that's been a quite an interesting um, experiment, which has been quite successful. The other, of course, was the Innovation Agency in Malaysia Social Outcome Fund uh, that has now concluded but um, and repaid all its investors. And the impact uh, seen was three times the average um, the savings for government. So um, recently with COVID-19, uh, we have um, had some issuance of Sukuk. Uh, and uh, in fact, it was oversubscribed um, both uh, uh, at the retail side as well. Uh, it, it's not particularly re impact um, uh, related, but having seen even in a time of a pandemic, the appetite for investors are still there. You know, they had to expand the sukuk from 500 million to 666 million ringgit means that there is still appetite for uh, this kind of investment. And I would, and I, in retrospect, I was thinking that why didn't the whole world think about a, a social impact bond for vaccine development, right? Um, because you can, you can quite easily see the impact and you can measure the impact in, in this. So I think there's, there's many things we can actually learn and, and expand on this. Uh, I think recently the, the Securities Commission in Malaysia you know, had a couple of roundtables. And while I've painted a picture that looks a little bit rosy in terms of the Malaysian government's appetite and willingness and, and having to have a... Uh, uh, you know, social impact investment uh, um, landscape. I think that there's still a lot of uh, social enterprises in Malaysia that struggle to find the funding. Uh, and I think that, you know, uh, this is going to be a challenge. How do you take it from a startup to a large scale uh, in terms of social investing? And I think we have to look at how we access, we allow access to funding for the social uh, enterprises uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, I think there's a lot uh, to be done and uh, it's very also encouraging that in the uh, we are currently debating the budget 2021 in parliament but it's interesting uh, to note that um, it is uh, the ministry of finance has actually said the malaysia will work on issuing its first sustainability bond as a sovereign bond uh, and therefore it's really pointing towards looking at a more green and a more uh, sustainable financing for for the country 
Thanks very much, Jamila. And, and this is something we've seen through COVID has been um, quite a bit of activity of sovereign bonds relating to mm. either the SDGs or the aspects of the of the COVID recovery. Um, and it's something I think for that we can watch because it um, it is a mechanism potentially if we harness it well, where we can get to some of yep. that scale that you're talking about. Um, yeah. I'm interested, you, you used the word experimentation um, in, which is not a word we always hear in the context of, of policy. And some of the um, initiatives that you, that you mentioned uh, came from, um, at least from an outward appearance, uh, into the market in Malaysia in, in quite quickly in relative terms for, for yes. policy, including your outcomes fund. Were there key things in achieving that, do you think? I think it, it's very much dependent on leadership, right? If there's a leadership that embraces in, innovation, and certainly uh, the appetite for innovation in Malaysia right now is very high. Uh, there is, uh, in fact, um, the Malaysian government has, you know, has for some time established the Malaysian Global Innovation and Creativity Centre. And recently they have uh, created quite a significant fund uh, that they've put into something called Innovation Sandbox, where you know, social enterprises can apply for grants to actually develop their innovations. Uh, and I keep pressing that you know, innovations mustn't be, mustn't be tech or gadget driven it must really be very much systems driven so uh, i think this it creates an incredible opportunity for for all of us um and 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 i think you know at the end of the day bottom, bottom line it has to be leadership driven that, uh, you know, the leadership drives policy um, and then policy drives opportunities for that experimentation as i mentioned and also, you know, we need to also look at, you know, bringing in, you know, mapping out and building that, that uh, I use a, a network or, or um, the connections to, you know, whether it's corporates, whether government, uh, corp uh, social enterprises, you know, policymakers, and, and try to join all those dots, you know, in order for us to really take things forward. If I may, you mentioned my role in the Red Cross, so I, maybe I want to touch on one point, that when I was there, we were trying to build a blended finance model of uh, impact investment, and it was looking at how do you take traditional philanthropy, whether it's from donors, or it could be even uh, uh, financing from, say, Zakat, and then having a suku insurance, but also an impact bond uh, uh, and outcomes, um, outcome funding. You know, how do you bring this all together? And I think this is the, the, I think for the future, I think this is what we need to look at, blended models where the outcome is very, very clear. In this case, it was about reducing mortality from cholera and watery diseases, uh, watery diarrhea disease, uh, diseases. So I think... You know, how do we now move towards just a straightforward uh, outcome fund to one that looks into blended models? Thanks very much, Jamila. And that um, innovation for social progress and meeting people's um, needs as they experience them um, and the need for political and policy leadership is a, is a great note. And the um, opportunities for blended finance is a terrific segue for us to move to, um, uh, to Arastu. Um, thanks very much for your comments. And if there's time, I, I'd love to come back to you um, to pick up some of the themes. Um, Arastu, blended, uh, blended finance is something we've talked about in the context of, of of Bangladesh and, and you've been giving thought to the opportunities and challenges in um, the issues that are being faced by uh, a, you know, a country that is has been lower income, is working hard to, to come into the middle income ranks, but still has a, a lot of, of challenges to face yeah. into. Um, do you want to share with us your views about where government can play a powerful role? Okay, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to talk. Uh, but before, my, may I on the lightest uh, side start saying that if impact investment in Bangladesh were to succeed, then Rosemary Addis's name would go down as the mother of impact investment in Bangladesh. You have been very supportive from about four or five years we have started your name. You are always because you came, visited, you've been supportive. Thank you very much. So about the enabling, uh, and thank you very much, Jamila, for the for the you are trying to blend that sukuk and also zakat in in the blended finance uh, this structure. That's a good idea. We should put some pondering over that. Thank you. So the enabling policy environment uh, for impact investment uh, in Asia Pacific, the document largely follows the GSG document of 2018, which I had the privilege of. Uh, 
uh, reviewing in New Delhi uh, uh, broadly follows that, that this uh, document and uh, the, in this endeavor uh, compilation appears to be more professionally done than the KPMG first draft that we were asked to comment on. And after that, we didn't hear anything, but this is a good document, looks like. The views uh, reflected and the approach chartered out in this document appears to be in the right direction, uh, particularly its approach in engaging, in, to engaging the governments in the region through its three-pronged uh, design role, which is a market facilitator, which is through NABs, CPU, the central procurement, then capacity building, then as a market participant, participant like outcome funder, access to fund, impact procurement, and then market regulator as uh, uh, setting uh, legal forms and fiscal incentives. All these 15 toolkits have brought that broadly mimic the, the toolkit here in this document uh, are all embedded through the three uh, roles that of the government that you have designed. The but here on the financing gap, it, it, the, uh, this appears to be a real challenge both to the region and to the individual countries. Uh, a new and additional 5% or uh, translated into $1.5 trillion in the region against the size of 170 billion is a far cry because you have only 10 years time and you have to mobilize this amount for the region. And also a 50 trillion asset managed by APEC region that I see it has nothing much to do with the diversion of resources to SDG uh, achievement of goals. So, but having said that, we trust if that the governments could be engaged as a market regulator, as a market participant and a facilitator, good progress, I guess it can be made. Uh, in Bangladesh, when impact investment were, were advanced out, with, uh, we advanced it with this fundamental premise, uh, premises that the government can create an enabling environment uh, to attract greater uh, impact capital. So this role of the government set, had settled into the OECD DAC structure of market facilitator, market partic uh, participant, and the regulator. We didn't, when we started, we didn't see this role of as, as, as uh, OECD encapsulated or our GSD document suggested. The NAB is uh, here in Bangladesh is powered by uh, a very strong government representation led by the secretary of uh, finance. The central bank is there. The Bangladesh Investment Development Authority is there. The Securities Exchange Commission is also a member. ADB, the Asian Development Bank, IFC, the World Bank uh, Commercial Wing. Academics, we have business chambers, the British Council, uh, uh, the Swiss Development Board uh, Cooperation. So, so uh, actually, uh, NAB is tasked, it's, it's, NAB has given the responsibility to uh, prepare a, a strategy and action plan which we are currently working, and the British Council and SDC, including SCAP, are supporting this initiative in Bangladesh. Now, but now the government agencies in Bangladesh. Play, are playing out uh, uh, impact investment in a very proactive uh, manner, I would say. Uh, it is, I, I would imagine the private sector is not able to actually catch up with what the government is opening the doors of opportunity. Uh, let's say the Bangladesh Securities Exchange Commission has accommodated impact investment uh, uh, in, uh, fund for promoting impact investment in, in its law. So the Bangladesh Bank has institutionalized green financing, requiring that over all over 50 commercial banks have to put at least 5% of its investment in impact investment or green financing. Actually, it was green financing, and later what they have done gone further is that through a circular, Bangladesh Bank has classed impact fund as green fund. So this is a great uh, proactive support. Two percent stamp duty was was a draconian law that any foreign investors would have to give 2% of uh, uh, foreign 2% uh, uh, of the total uh, corpus size uh, that has been withdrawn and so it is much easier the money can easily come the national board of revenue which is the finance minister here there, there are also fiscal parts to impact investment both demand and supply side so in uh, these having this appears to be actually uh, uh, 
government seems to be very supportive uh, to this. Now, uh, in Bangladesh case, uh, the seven five-year plan, I'm talking of the financing gap here. This is a big thing that we, I don't know how to tackle it. Seven, seven five-year plan uh, identified funding gap of $890 billion in the next 10 years. Annually, Bangladesh has to come up $90 billion new and additional resources would be necessary. So Bangladesh GDP is about five, 350 billion. So 26% of GDP, whereas our tax to GDP ratio is only 11%. So I don't see how a 26% can be uh, actuated with this 11% uh, tax to GDP ratio. So additional funding comes from where I'm not very sure. But having said that, this brings us to into the play of a new concept as uh, we have discussed pretty elaborately and particularly our colleagues from OECD was very, uh, very particularly eloquent about is, is the idea of this uh, uh, blended finance. The OECD, the, the, the OECD, and OECD and the DAC blended finance principles and guidelines have come out very recently. And uh, this arrangement of finance uh, follows the heels of uh, Addis Ababa 2015 uh, 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 financing for development initiative. And I think this is a good way and to see impact investment is basically an approach to financing, such as uh, which looks into financial return and development impact. But blended finance is more a, more a structuring of transactions to bring multiple types of investors. You can have the private sector leverage through uh, development uh, uh, DP partners, uh, foreign aid, it can be pu public fund of the government and that's how it could be actually more and more resources could be leveraged uh, uh, by, by bringing in private sector. So the blended finance is basically the use of catalytic capital from the government, DP, development partners to leverage private sector uh, involvement. So uh, here is where we see uh, some relevance and the ERD here, the Economic Relations Division, the, the sec, uh, of the Finance Division, they uh, are also, also talking and uh, the Swiss Development Agency, the Swiss here are also talking about uh, how to uh, beef up D DP, uh, the development partners can help in bringing in more public, uh, uh, private uh, uh, capital through their segment. So uh, this, is, this is something we should be looked into and the following actions which may be considered for the government to, to in, for the intervention that we think here we can, could possibly to do is the collaborative action with DPs in allocating significant portion of their foreign aid portfolio into by blended finance. If uh, part of it could be given as a blended finance separate and so more and more private sector fund could flow in. This is one thing. Number two is government's uh, central procurement unit must accommodate its, in its guideline the procurement from impact investment instruments, such as SIBs, the social investment bonds and the development investment bonds. The gov another number three point is that the government could be persuaded to agree to become an outcome funders, uh, which reduces the risk of many government programs often seen gets infructuous. So other actors here could be the investors, the implementers, the beneficiaries, while the government retains the role of the outcome funders, only funding as what is called the so-called pay for success approach. The Securities Exchange Commission may provide special incentives to fund managers to invest in impact-based companies. So we have to, broadly have a broad awareness among ourselves so that impact investment ecosystem can be developed in Bangladesh and then we can go ahead. So these were my uh, thoughts uh, that I thought I should share. Uh, thank you very much, Rosemary. Thank you very much, um, Arasu, for your kind words and for sharing that overview with us and, and so nicely um, illustrating how government can use different levers to provide um, carrots and sticks, if, um, to put it in the Definitely. vernacular, removing barriers, but also providing um, incentives for um, people to um, perhaps invest in and um, engage in ways they might not otherwise. 
I'm, I'm going to move on to Patsyana and, and if time allows, I'd like to come back to you with a, a couple of, of questions. No problem, uh, no problem, okay. Uh, Patsyan, uh, thank you for joining us today. And I know that you've had the vantage point for a few years now with AVPN to be able to look across across the region. It would be terrific to hear your perspectives on where you see governments active and how you think they can engage most powerfully in, um, in relation to some of the things that are um, priorities as we uh, come through and, um, and build back from COVID. Thanks for having me, Rosemary, and uh, good afternoon or good morning to people on the line. Great pleasure to be here. Um, very informative as well, uh, what we've heard so far from uh, Mr. Arastu and Dr. Jamila. Um, I think what's possibly an interesting perspective I'd like to share um, is that where, where we sit, um, the representative of the largest social investment and impact investment community in Asia, um, is that we are uh, observing uh, an increased level of interest, uh, increased level of engagement between what is characterized as private sector capital from our community with governments. And the, the engagement is uh, occurring um, in rather unusual ways. Um, I would say that the, the progressive and optimistic uh, trend that I'm seeing is that the engagement isn't only revolving around changing the regulatory environment or trying to move different kinds of legislation. Uh, we are seeing engagement along um, different ways to mobilize capital, for example. And by that, um, some of the examples that Mr. Arastu had mentioned in res with respect to looking at opportunities to um, provide a de-risking, uh, participating in vendor finance instruments, for example. Um, but also uh, when it comes to capital mobilization, um, recognizing the full continuum of capital that can help to support the growth of opportunity from, uh, from, from different levels of maturity in different markets, uh, as well as different industry sectors, so that there is, a, uh, there is an organic movement of capital and, and investment opportunity from the early um, initiatives uh, around bringing social impact and creating social impact, all the way through to financially viable, investable, scalable opportunities as well for capital to move. Um, the reason why this is critical is because um, as was uh, mentioned earlier on by Mr. Da Silva, we don't want an environment where impact investing is uh, the, the, the space of large institutional investors looking for only large, uh, large investment tickets because that's not how markets form. Um, these kinds of large scalable investments do not appear on their own. There has to be an ecosystem that brings these about that allows opportunities to grow to this size. Um, and that's where some, that's where we are seeing that there's more interest and um, engagement by governments uh, to want to build these opportunities with the impact investing and private capital sector. Uh, just to illustrate that with some examples, um, we have seen uh, in some of the more uh, developed markets, of course, like Singapore, Japan, Korea, where the government is very actively involved in the social impact uh, startup sector. Um, both in terms of creating ecosystems for growth, but also providing seed funds of different forms. Um, but increasingly in some of the de developing markets, we're also seeing that there's a recognition of the role that venture philanthropy, um, startup investment, impact investing can play in seeding the growth of these kinds of um, uh, ecosystems. So um, Dr. Jamila, what you talked about happening in Malaysia is a very good example between um, uh, the work that was done by Magic and, and by the Outcomes Fund. Um, but also more recently, uh, we, we had engaged in a partnership with the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy to introduce um, the role of private sector capital to, to see the growth of creative enterprises, which play a very significant role in the GDP and livelihoods um, opportunities in Indonesia. Um, and this was critical for their growth and progression, not only because of it being the uh, previously untapped source of capital, but also because they recognize that in order for these creative enterprises to grow to the stage where they can get more viable um, and commercial investment, uh, they needed something to get them to, uh, to, to towards that level of growth. So this is an example of where um, there is a recognition of the, the, the holistic um, engagement of a full continuum of capital. Um, the other point I wanted to bring up also is the openness of partnerships in uh, capacity building and harmonization of impact um, measurement. I think this is something that is um, a, a really interesting trend to watch out for. Um, between the Securities Exchange Commission uh, in Thailand, the Monetary Authority in Singapore, 
um, there is a definite focus on how can we introduce a more consistent, sustainable, and harmonized way for different investor, different parts of the investor community to build up the, the, the capacity of uh, impact frameworks, uh, sustainability frameworks that will help them make better capital decisions. Um, this can be uh, guidelines around how they are going to raise uh, sustainability linked bonds. It can also be, for example, in the case of Singapore, very specific financial incentives around building frameworks um, that will guide the issuance of uh, sustainability linked uh, financing. Um, it's an interesting uh, development because at the same time, you're also seeing uh, commitments by um, the different parts of government um, to, to want to align some of their national development um, measurements with how they can mobilize capital. So uh, the Ministry of National Development Planning, for example, in Indonesia, had very specifically looked to introduce its national planning uh, initiatives alongside its SDG financing efforts so that there will be that kind of harmonization, harmonization and alignment towards national outcomes. Um, there is also the, uh, the work that's been done by um, Invest India, and this is fresh off the press, to, to bring uh, SDG impact standards as a way to incentivize and catalyze more investment towards SDG projects in India. Um, and last but not least, also the uh, interest and engagement by uh, India's uh, planning committee, uh, Niti Aayog, the formerly National Planning Commission, um, to introduce um, monitoring and evaluation standards into for the government into the engagement of private capital. So those are interesting initiatives as well because it's showing that there is an opportunity between the impact investment community uh, and policymaker community to harmonize language, harmonize frameworks, and the way that they can jointly find uh, common goals that are measurable where capital has a way to achieve a set of results that both sides of the ecosystem will agree on. Thanks, Patian, for that terrific view across the ecosystem and showing us that, um, that as we see also in the, in the report, for all that we need to be very focused on the context, there are also a number of things that we can draw from across different jurisdictions and, um, and cross-fertilise to be able to accelerate things. I'd like to just put to you one of the questions that's come up in the Q&A, which is around the, that old conundrum about, um, is there enough pipeline? Um, and we often hear this discussion, is, you know, is it a supply of capital issues, is it a pipeline issue? Um, my personal view is there's a, a lot in the um, intermediation that's needed to actually connect those things. Uh, it'd be terrific to get your perspective on that question uh, from a, a cross Asia perspective. Mm. Um, I think that this this point about whether or not there's enough pipeline may be a, a matter of um, how far down the pipeline are you looking. Um, meaning that um, there is there is indeed, as you say, intermediation um, and also a significant amount of capacity building work that needs to be done in order to bring the kinds of uh, opportunities that may exist for impact capital to be mobilized to 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 be meeting the capital uh, providers. Um, but I, I make the case that it's not a one way street, meaning that it's not just about pushing more pipeline available to the investment community. I think the investment community and impact investing in particular also needs to um, be mobilizing the full force of the of different forms of impact investors to recognize and in different forms of instruments to recognize that pipeline isn't a, a, a one way movement. It needs to also be um, engaging with capital at different levels of its growth. Um, and this can be not only be in the form of incubators and accelerators playing a role or seed or growth capital being mobilized. But it is also uh, talking about um, investing in transparency of impact management and measurement. It is about investing in capacity building of um, uh, government officials and, and policy policymakers that are working on policy projects who understand and can mobilize and, and find ways to, to, to mobilize capital. Um, it is about investing in um, the, the uh, level of competency and capability of the uh, enterprises on the ground. Um, another point I wanted to make also about pipeline is that it is not just one type of pipeline. Um, there are many different opportunities for impact uh, and for impact capital if we were to cast our net more holistically. And I think post pandemic, this has never been more clear. Um, you know, we, we are seeing much stronger demand around intersectional opportunities where 
gender outcomes are uh, just as important as health outcomes, where there is a mutual dependency of livelihoods and climate action between gender equality and education. Um, you know, it's no longer a single issue investment that people are looking for, and, and rightly so, because these are not single issue challenges we're facing. So if we were to unlock more opportunities for mobilizing capital towards um, more intersectional or, or mutually dependent uh, type investment opportunities, then pipeline can be broader. Uh, we also are looking at um, looking at pipeline that doesn't just uh, look at enterprises. Uh, you can have impact capital pipeline that are going towards um, larger skill ready businesses, even local companies or local capital markets. Um, you can look at pipeline that goes towards, in fact, government projects that are impact driven or sustainability linked. Um, there are many ways that impact capital can, in fact, be mobilized towards a broader and potentially more robust pipeline uh, in, from that perspective as well. Terrific. That's a that's a great note to end on in terms of the the possibility um, and for people to engage in a range of, of different ways and um, and I'll just finish uh, Patsy and um, we've answered a number of the questions through the conversation with the three of you um, and I do want to just come back through our um, uh, through our um, uh, panelists and just have the very very briefest um, of if I was um, able to say to you today, you can have one thing in 2021 that will really you know, um, advance the impact investment market in a way that's meaningful to, to people that uh, you know, I can get your government to do one thing, what would be top of your list? Patsy, and we'll start with you and then just very briefly go to Arastu and Jamila because then we want to wrap up and, um, and hand back for the, for the final comments. Of course, um, I'd like to say partnerships, um, meaning for, for government that is uh, ready for partnerships. Um, by that, I mean to be open to partnering, not only just in terms of trying to get consultations or inputs for legislative change, nor only just looking for financing or capital, but also to look at uh, creating partners that can build capacity, strengthen ecosystem, build bridges to the full continuum of the impact sector. Terrific. Um, Arastu, in, in 30 seconds, if I give you the one wish, what would you be asking governments to do? You're on mute. You're still on mute, Arastu. Perhaps while Arastu is coming off, off of mute, maybe we'll, Jamila will come to you. Um, and, okay. uh, oh. I guess, I guess yeah. I, I'm back there. Anyway, uh, I would like to actually, the government seems to be pretty ready we, as i said that there are a lot of ecosystem the the steps taken by the central bank the security exchange commission the ministry of finance through the uh, uh, fiscal parks they are actually they are doing pretty well but it's the private sector i don't see it's coming to the fore that is more important so private sector if they if they have to come forward and that would one of the reason would be maybe the savings ratio in this country is not as much the private sector I'm not sure to what extent uh, there is surplus money to put into these uh, endeavors where there are not sufficient, uh, uh, you know, the uh, return. So that is where it is very important. So I will imagine the private sector should come forward. That that's what Great. we have to work on. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. And Jamila, finishing off with with you, um, your one your one shot in the locker. I think it's uh, create incentives, uh, create incentives for partnership, create incentives for investment in impact investing and create, inve uh, create incentives for you know, capacity development and building that ecosystem for it to work. Terrific. Thank you. And thanks to all of our panelists for sharing their views uh, today. It's now uh, my job as, as we turn off our, um, our microphones and cameras to hand back to uh, Christina Tora and Jonathan Wong, who uh, were the originators of, of this project, as you heard earlier, um, to close us out for the discussion. So Christina and Jonathan, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Rosemary, and thank you so much, uh, everyone, uh, for your contributions. Um, so, I'm, I'm just going to close off with um, a few examples or things that have inspired me during uh, the, 
the, the course of this work and um, which is a journey. Um, and, and thanks, Patien, for your call for action being on the, uh, you know, the, the, the frame of partnerships, because that's really where I would like us to, to end this conversation with. Um, and we've been talking about many different SDGs. Um, for, for me, the, the, my, my favorite SDG is SDG 17, is the partnerships one. And so um, let me tell you about four people um, I met during this work um, and just to give you a bit of kind of human flavor of, of what has um, to me been so inspiring in terms of how Asia was leading um, and pioneering on so many of these topics before the crisis and hopefully will keep doing so now as well. Um, we met uh, during the course of this work with uh, someone called um, uh, Dina Arianti, and uh, she's running a consortium of 2000 Bumdes villages in Indonesia. Um, and she's uh, helping them get more uh, entrepreneurial. So basically creating village based businesses within all of Indonesia. And she's working with the financial authority in Indonesia to do that and creating partnership with lots of NGOs and other organizations like Nature Conservancy, um, a local um, FedEx type organization to, to really boost um, uh, business, livelihood development uh, in the most remote areas of, of Indonesia. And that's really an example of scale and business coming together, working with government and many other partners to do that. Um, of course, we mentioned uh, Malaysia and the outcomes out, outcomes fund. Uh, Melissa Fu shared a lot about how they came to life, how the government worked with many service providers to deliver the work around uh, early childhood education in uh, indigenous communities, around water pr provision in faraway rural areas, um, and so many other impacts that have been created thanks to that pioneering work, the first outcome fund actually in the world. Um, we also met in, in Thailand with someone called uh, Nupako uh, Susharitaku, uh, who's working at the Thai Stock Exchange. Um, and the Thai Stock Exchange is, is not very well known for its work right now, but it's really interesting to see how they're working with listed companies to build their capacity to help them um, get more impactful and um, get really on track to, to be um, in, in, in the wake of, um, if you want, social businesses, measuring their impact, creating more impact and, um, and acknowledging that. Um, working also to, to support social businesses in Thailand. And finally, we met with Minister Tarman in Singapore uh, who told us about the, and he was, of course, the chair of the G20 Eminent Persons Group on um, Global Financial Governance. And he's the one also who really does believe in collaboration and the partnerships um, for the global, um, the sustainable global goals. Um, and so, so I think that just to end here, so many people are convinced about this. Um, we have been seeing lots of great pioneering work and what we want to see is more of that. Um, we, we at the GSG are working with what we call national advisory boards. Um, we currently have 33 countries who have national advisory boards and uh, we're supporting them, coordinating them, sharing knowledge between countries and, and helping countries get um, get organized uh, to create the best possible infrastructure to drive more capital towards impact and creating impact for uh, people and planet. So we, we have been and we want to keep working with all of you um, in, in Sri Lanka, in India, in Bangladesh, um, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, China, um, and many of the other countries uh, that uh, ha don't have yet Indonesia, that don't have yet a national advisory board. So um, this is just uh, a step in the journey and uh, looking forward to, uh, to more. Jonathan, over to you. Thank you very much, Christina. I I'm very mindful of the time, so I'll be quick. 
as, 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 as several people mentioned, this is the end of the session, but the start of this journey. And, and on reflecting, if you look at government policy making on impact investing, it is still very much in its infancy when you compare it to more traditional forms of investing, such as FDI, which people talk about, or indeed venture capital. Uh, and as Seb mentioned, it is still evolving. So, so my call to for policymakers would really be to continue with that policy experimentation, as Dr. Jim Miller said, and the policy evaluation, because I think this will be absolutely key in moving this, 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 if you like, emerging field from from, from art to science, or, or indeed balancing the art and science, because uh, it's always maybe good to keep a little bit of art in the policy making as well. Um, also, my call to policymakers would be, uh, and as, as Christina and, 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 and Patsy and both mentioned, is, is the spirit of partnership and really to be open to co-creating these policies with, with the ecosystem actors and indeed the call to action for ecosystem actors to engage in that process as well. Uh, just on behalf of SCAP, SCAP and I'm sure GSG as well, I mean, we, we very much stand ready to support governments in the region with the development of impact investing initiatives, whether that be NABs, impact investing policies or indeed specific instruments. We're, we're very, very happy to support that and to support um, ecosystem actors how, however we can. Uh, and just, just to let me end with just saying thank you to all for joining, but I do want to say a special thank you to, to Michal from my team uh, and Mia who have supported this work, who, who, who's my boss. And, and also a special thanks to Seven and, and Raffaella and, and Christina on, on what has been just a really interesting journey in this report and, and hopefully the first step in this process. And, and again, a very, a very special thanks to Seb because I, I'm based in Thailand, Seb in Argentina. That time difference doesn't work out, out well for Seb. So he's been doing a lot of early morning. So a huge thank you for that. So, so that just leaves me to say, again, thank you all for joining today. Um, and do feel free to reach out to us if, if we can support you in any way, whether you're a government policymaker or indeed in an ecosystem actor. We really want to continue this conversation and, 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 and as we move into 2021 and say goodbye for this year. So, so thank you all very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. See you soon.